engine and this is done roughly with the same kind of pulses that we're using for the fan. Uh, a cylinder engine has certain kind of some jitter to it because of the way that the fuel supplies and the way it interacts with the exhaust system. Uh, there's, you know, uh, each of these cylinders is effectively producing these parabolic pulses which are then being fed into the exhaust system. And we haven't modelled much of this, we've just given it a rough sketch. Yeah? Got our engine speed. The tail rotor is um, a multi-bladed fan, but it's like mostly hear the edge noise from this, so it's very noisy. I think it's about 32 blades, something like that. Um, and what we're going to do is we're going to couple the engine through a gearing system to the tail rotor, but you'll hear that there's not a directly synchronous relationship between these two. So. Um, with the clutching system, as this engine speeds up, this will follow it, but not exactly, so we have to catch up. Let's hear that coupling. Um, engine mix. So you can hear already at that particular speed, there's some beating. Yeah. Uh, okay, so you hear the, the reaction between those two. model than the, the simple fan that we had before. What we've got in the, the, the main rotor of the helicopter is this phenomenon called uh, blade slap from turbulence. So as the leading blade's coming round, it's creating in its weight this vortex, yeah? And the, the blade coming up behind it hits this vortex. Now, if you've been on a plane, you know what turbulence is, yeah? It's like bump, yeah? It's suddenly, it's, a, it's like hitting a solid object. So that's exciting the blade, causing it a certain position on the blade, like it's been struck, so it vibrates. And it causes this uh, radial motion, this radial energy to come out. And the sound from the, from the ro rotor of the helicopter kind of comes out in spokes. So actually you can use this in terms of uh, ranging a vehicle and knowing if it's converging on your position. If you hear, if it's coming straight at you, you, you hear constant blade slap. Whereas if it's moving obliquely to your position, you'll hear So you'll know kind of where it's heading. Um, another interesting thing is, is that if you're in a static position, you come over uh, and the vehicle comes over you, at some point, all you're going to have is down drop. Because the, 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 the blade slap goes out in this radial fashion. You only hear it from the distance. As it moves over, you don't hear any blade slap at all. Now let's say that you're hearing an asymmetrical blade slap because this side's advancing and this side's retreating from you. As it passes over you, those reverse. So there's interesting stereo effect of it, uh, of an overhead, of it, it's going ba 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 da ba da ba da ba yeah? So there's a really interesting interactive possibilities of, of how this, um, I haven't even gone into like how this changes the sound. You can hear there's some things up here that label like symmetry and um, uh, resonance and stuff. You can, it's a very subtle. do now is we're going to put all of the parts together um, of the gearbox, which you haven't heard, it's a gearbox, here's a gear mix. So this is actually really quiet, it just sits on the top of the other stuff. Uh, kind of somewhere like that. Uh, it's putting the main motor in.
acoustic effect in the distancing algorithm, which makes a big difference to this, um, is that we can play around with the relative amplitude of the parts. But what we'd really like to do is to contextualize it acoustically too. So we need to take into account like ground effects and things. If I'm uh, an observer on the ground, and I've got um, so helicopters moving through the air towards over my position, I've got two paths. One is a direct path from the vehicle to me, and the other one is from the ground. It's bouncing up, usually going to be a few metres in front of me. Now, you'll hear this in any aerial vehicle, plane, helicopter, whatever. If it's making a sound, a jet, is this kind of phasing, this band rejection, this sort of scooping out of the sound, which move, as it goes overhead, kind of moves up and down. It's this, yeah? And what we're going to do is, as we distance this helicopter, we're going to apply a couple of different things. One is this ground effect, and the other one is a, a dispersive lossiness, which is basically a kind of low-pass filter, because it's moving over several kilometers. So we're going to lose some of the highs. So what we'll do now is we'll mix all the stuff in, and then we'll push it off into the distance and send it off behind the hill somewhere, and, and have it come back. Each of them in itself is really simple sound source. There's really nothing going on behind each of those. You could kind of go, oh yeah, engine sound, fan, you've seen how they all, that they're all made. And now that we put them together, the, the, the difficulty becomes to control code. So here's a negative side to computational audio in virtual reality, is you have to be able to hook into these models now with, with, with actual game parameter data. Uh, obviously, we're going to try and reduce them to the, to the minimal useful set, but we want to be able to... Uh, well, this is where piloting the vehicle becomes interesting, because once you move into the cockpit and start to play around with it, or a racing car or something, then the things that you do, like in terms of gears and steering and all of this, begins to uh, inform and parameterize the model. We need to make sure that this happens in a, a realistic and interesting, fun way. Nice thing is, is that we can easily go into hyper reality. Yeah? So, I'm going to show you a model now which goes into hyper reality. It's this word, you know, and, and to kind of anchor it in, in, in like Baudrillard, you know, his idea of hyper reality is kind of not quite what we're talking about in, film, in, 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 in this domain so much. My philosophy is that. Hyper-reality only makes sense from an understood reality. So you have to first anchor yourself on a known set of, of, of physical behaviours. Um, David, Breck, um, in, the, in Richard Boulanger's Sea Sound book, there's an excellent chapter uh, where, uh, I forget the, the, author, the author of the chapter's name for a moment, um, talks about acoustic viability and that we have an intrinsic understanding of what makes sense in terms of phys physics from sound. We know what is plausible and what's not. But if we play around with the edges of that, if we take the established reality and just push certain parts of it, we can create these kind of hyper-real objects, like racing cars um, which have in impossibly overdriven engines, for example. Or, um, so. That's what the next example is. Let's find. Here's our.
It's a great big wave guide. You know, what I kind of sussed with this very early on is that most of the good sound of a powerful engine is to do with the exhaust. The exhaust system is like a trumpet, right? You've got this impulsive source from the pistons, and they're basically going into a huge amplifier and resonator. And to the extent that people design cars for urban use, they want to minimize the noise. But to the extent that we're sound designers want to turn them into nasty, huge um, things for racing games, then we just kind of pick the, op pick the parameters and do the opposite. So what I've got here is a model which creates a non-linear waveguide, which is able to produce distortions in the impulses and make it sound like it has sympathetic resonances. So different parts of the exhaust system are coupled to the vehicle in different places. Uh, so halfway along, maybe we're holding it and we're coupling to the chassis here. So if we get a node or an anti-node here, we'll, we'll hear this come out and it's coupling to the chassis. Uh, I mean, there's, there's six tap points in the waveguide, and each is coupled to its own resonator, and they're faked using this uh, method. That, it's a method that I kind of cooked up. It's called um, time time warping the waveguide. Yeah, so we're effectively changing the dimensions of the waveguide in real time as a way to introduce non-linearities or overdriving. You could do this for trumpet, it'd be very effective for trumpet. For so um, let's crank it a bit and just rev it, yeah? And hear how it behaves. Uh, very low revs, yeah? Impossibly low revs, yeah? It's not sample playback. Sweet spot where it really hits the resonance of the of, of the chassis or something. So yeah. again, like the clock, once we've made one of these, fitting it out to, to suit different vehicles in a game or, or, or slightly different applications is just a question of working with these parameters at a high level now, um, and also coupling it to the way that the vehicle's driven properly, so that the player interacts with it in a nice way. I've only got one slide there; we could do a lot more with it. So, how are we doing for times that? Like? Shall I put up some more examples? Or it is good one. It's it spot is on, good. is it? Yeah. yeah, great. Have we got time for some questions? Or uh, yeah, possibly. Well, we have to rush over to the research seminar room. So, yeah. Uh, actually, uh, if anyone has questions, Andy's back here at five o'clock. At which point we will have the workshops. So at that point you will be installing PD. He'll probably tell you some things about how it's different from Max MSP, and you can play, have a play with these things yourselves. And at that point, it will be much more open, all the questions and all of this. Okay, yeah. So I think we should wrap it up here. Thank you, Andy. <laughs> Thank you. Uh, also, at 4 o'clock, 4 to 5, we have this slot where you can have more personal contact with Andy. I don't have a room yet. What we'll do is I'll have Andy 